welcome to The Lair, a place where interesting people you may know tell you things you didn't. So grab a chair and your favorite vice and get comfortable. There are no rules in The Lair, but there is Laura Babcock. You know her from TV, and she is not into media monogamy. Let's find out who else is in The Lair. Well, we're here in the lair with uh, the mayor of Hamilton. I'm sorry, that was the that was the air show that called you the mayor of Hamilton. It's, uh, did you hear about that? You no. must have. You no. didn't hear about that? No. I'm the first one to tell you that. Yeah. It was all over Twitter on Sunday. I the rumor has it that at the air show, uh, the announcer said the mayor of Hamilton, uh, Lloyd Ferguson. You didn't hear about that? No. Well, it's, you've got to get on Twitter, Lloyd. <laughs> You're missing. Yeah, my daughters are on Twitter. They both got computer science degrees and. And, and my, but the one lives in New York has a program. Anytime my name's mentioned, it pops out. So I'm sure she'll be uh, yeah, oh, leaving me awesome. a, an email sometime tonight in my home email. A, it came up from a credible Hamilton Twitter news source that you had been called that at the air show. Uh -oh. So I retweeted that out, and I got a lot of way to go Lloyds coming in. <laughs> so, yeah, poor Bob. Yeah, yeah I got to be in trouble with the mayor now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <But> Again. <laughs> the, idea, the idea of Lloyd Ferguson for mayors. Not a new idea. Your name was floated around in the last election. Are you glad that you didn't run? Yes. Yeah, I, I like representing the people of Ancaster. It's a, it's a very special community. And it, <laughs> That's Marie Boutriani here in the lair. She's in the, the peanut gallery. I should also introduce Mike. Cameron is here again, our producer, and Daryl. Yeah, you no, know, Ancaster, I see Ancaster is a very special place, and uh, um, I want to keep it that way. Yeah. I, I, when developers come in and want to use this provincial policy on intensification, I always get the same answer. Ancaster is a very special community and it's not going to get screwed up under my watch. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no. What, what makes it special? Well, I think it's because we had uh, zoning bylaws in place a long time ago, for example, mm -hmm. the limit to three floors. Oh. I think we always had a tree planting policy. Uh, you know, there's a, a young doctor uh, who's in my Rotary Club and I asked her, just, she grew up in Brampton and came to Ancaster to practice. And I said, no, if you grew up in Brantford and were educated in Toronto, why would you come to Ancaster and practice? And she had one word, trees. Oh, wow. And we've been very protective of the trees, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, we've still been able to maintain our tree bylaw. Mm -hmm. uh, it never got uh, chopped down, if you will, during <laughs> the uh, amalgamation debate. Uh, there See, was I wouldn't have thought of trees as being what really sets Ancaster apart. To me, it's about the buildings. Yeah, it's, it's the third oldest municipality in the province of Ontario, and there's yeah. been a lot of work to preserve the, the heritage features, and there's some owners of some commercial properties that are very passionate mm -hmm. about maintaining that. In fact, whenever they build new buildings now, we, we try to, we, through the new planning act, we actually have control over facades, but most owners want to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. Make it look 100 years old when it's brand new. And <laughs> well, I thought I heard a, st a statistic recently that you're one of the best examples of a certain heritage period, maybe even in North America, in terms of just how it's, there's those few blocks there that are really, really beautiful. Um, and so it's been partly because of violence, but also your family has been involved for generations. Yes. How did they initially get into politics in Ancaster? Well, I, I believe it started back in the mid-50s. I, I remember as a kid, my father going off to school board meetings. He'll, he got himself on the Ancaster High School Board. When, when it opened in 1958, he was, he was either vice chair or chair. And afterwards, he moved over to city council and later on ran for Reeve and won. I always remember that election night. He won by six votes. And uh, I was 18 at the time. And so he took off to Florida for a vacation, and the judge came in and did a recount, and it actually went up to seven. Wow. And, and so that's a, a pretty tight race to win by, yeah. by six votes. So he, uh, six months though after that election, he died suddenly at home of a heart attack. Oh, I come home my first day of post-secondary education and found him in the driveway. My sister was there just ahead of me. Oh my God. So then my mother ran for council, and uh, she was there 10 years, and she passed away from cancer. In the meantime, I, was, I ran in 1981 for the Wentworth County Board of Education. I actually was appointed for one year because there was a vacancy. Ran the elect next election uh, for three years, and I was there too. As vice chairman of the board, my mother passed away, so then I ran in a by-election, mm. and, and uh, then ran again in three subsequent elections and won. And then I became general manager of Dufferin Construction, and I was traveling all the time. They're all across the country, so you're always in airplanes. Yeah. I was the district manager, so I stepped down and Murray ran. Yeah. And Murray ran for my brother for uh, two terms, 
and um, then the amalgamation happened. He ran to represent all of Ancaster in one. Then he had his stroke five years ago, and the seat remained uh, vacant for a year till the next election. I'd retired from Dufferin, so I ran in his place, ran again last fall, and the rest is history, as you say. So. <laughs> well, there was a lot of talk at the time that... Um, that you would certainly have the opportunity to carry on for Murray. I mean, the, the Ferguson name has, uh, you know, it's sort of like the, what the Kennedys are to the U.S., the Ferguson family is to Ancaster <laughs> in terms of politics. And so it was no surprise that you did as well as you did. But to the question about mayor, and I bring it up because you bring a certain amount of pedigree and skills, both the political pedigree of your family and all those years in politics, but also your own commercial success, your work at Dufferin. I first interviewed you back for a TV show in Oakville, I don't know, six, seven, I'm not going to date how long. I think it was more than that, Laura. (laughs) A while ago. Yeah, I think it was right after we won the 407 contract in the late 90s, yeah. Uh, So I I met you first in your capacity as a business leader in another community, Um, and uh, there is talk because of that, I think, that you bring those dual skills to the table, both the, both the political pedigree of your family and the popularity of your family, but also your success in business. Hamilton is a community, arguably, that can use development, that can use some business savvy around the table. It's been criticized for decades, it would seem, for maybe not making the most strategic decisions. You seem to stand out to me. Do you get that experience from people? Do they feel that about your leadership on council? Probably. You know, I bring a business acronym, which is good. Uh, other members of council bring other skills. Uh, I think it's well balanced. I think our current mayor is very good at the social side of the job. Um, I, he brings a media background. He does a media we background. We talk a lot in and, media. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think he's exceeding expectations mm-hmm. yeah, since he's been elected. And it's, it's amazing to watch him, though, is that he doesn't engage in debates. And, and the classic one was area rating. And this was, as I was quoted in The Spectator, this was two trains coming down the same track, opposite directions, full throttle. Wow. And it was going to be a train wreck. Well, uh, didn't you use the actual analogy, there was going to be mutiny on Mount... Oh, that was about another... No, that was about area rating. When you, area you, rating. Your initial uh, shot across the bow for your part of the argument was there'd be mutiny on the mountain if they there, were to Well, mutiny in Ancaster because Ancaster, Ancaster uh, uh, is still bitter about amalgamation. Yeah. Mm. They see a significant reduction in service, and I, I'm not sure there has been, but they see, uh, and, and it's true, there's only one voice on council now, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues, uh, or some of my colleagues, I shouldn't say a lot, some of my colleagues are not big fans of that community. They think we should be paying more, and the people of Ancaster say they're already paying more than their fair share. Uh, you know, our, our ward is the second biggest contributor to tax revenue you know, from Ancaster, mm-hmm. from Ward 12. The biggest is Central Mountain, but, and they have a population of 60,000. Ancaster has a population of 30,000. And, and so um, people aspire to move to Ancaster, and, which is okay, but the downside of that is that prices have escalated so much, mm-hmm. which has resulted in, and I really feel bad for the seniors. I hear from them every day who live in the older parts of the community. And we used to be on septic tanks until the 70s. Mm, and right. so they're, they're big lots. And they're wartime homes, nice quaint little 1,200 square foot bungalows. And because of the, uh, the intensification rules and no more urban sprawl, no new mm-hmm. subdivisions, and Ancaster is a quaint little community. People will come in and pay $600,000 and tear down the house and put up a monster. Right. And then Impact walks in and says, ha-ha, if their house is worth that, then yours is worth that right. much. Here's some senior citizen in their 70s right. whose taxes have just doubled. And uh, now you try to explain to them, well, the value of your home's also doubled, and, but they don't care. They just want to stay there, and they can't afford the taxes on a fixed income. So, if, if so it's a big problem. So Vancaster is a community, certainly you're passionate about, worth protecting, worth advocating for around council. And as you said, there's but one voice for Ancaster around council. Wouldn't um, mayor's role, bully pulpit, give you more opportunity to keep the Ancaster asset part of the community and, and sort of part of the Hamilton solution? I'm just throwing it out there, Lloyd, because you I know you, you, you keep bringing me back well, to that, Laura. I do, because you know <laughs> but what? It's the, the, the current mayor has only been on the job six months, yeah, and, and we've got it's three a, and a half years to go. It's not even and, about the, are you going to run for mayor? It's more the idea that your Ancaster, as you said, who contributes a great deal of money into the community, is a, 
in a way a distinct community from the rest of the city. Every community's got something different about it. Ancaster is known for what it's well, known Westdale's for. Westdale's special too, and Waterdale's yeah, special. Yeah, they're all and, different. And Stony um, Creek. But, you know, any, any uh, you didn't run for mayor, maybe you never will, but do you see opportunity to represent people in Ancaster even more than you currently are? Because I think one of the misconceptions people have is they think that these suburbs are out there doing their thing and not interested in what's happening down in the core, but in fact, it's quite the opposite. They feel the pain of what's happening downtown Hamilton. It affects them in their pocketbooks on issues like you cited, area rating. It has a direct impact on them. So do you think that, you know, there's enough opportunity uh, for you to represent Ancaster I, the way it's structured now? I would hope personally that we, we made some movement towards saying that we're, we're, you know, what's good for downtown Hamilton is also good for Ancaster. And, and I think I showed that leadership on, on city hall renovation. Mm -hmm. You know, I brought my construction expertise in. We got that, you know, we had great staff involvement, but that's a project. We went to a risky new delivery model, brought it in under, under budget, ahead, and of under, ahead of schedule. And people yeah. tell me that, ex most people tell me it exceeds their expectations. And by the way, for your listeners, <laughs> those ridiculous fountains who had the wrong heads on them were, shu <laughs> were, were shut down today. The fountains were drained. The, the, the proper heads were on back order forever. They're being installed this week and should be turned on by Friday but with multiple point, heads. To your point, I can't remember, and I've said this publicly, a time when a project in Hamilton was done ahead of schedule and under budget, um, which is why I'm driving at this leadership angle, Lloyd, is that that was a project that you were taking on based on your expertise that you brought to the council table, and it, had, it was a big success. Um, there was a recent discussion, I don't want to date this too much because it might air in a, f in a few more weeks, but there was a discussion recently where city staff, after you guys had completed your budget deliberations, come in at 0.8% tax increase, which is laudable. You know, I know you guys were gunning for zero, but 0.8 is pretty good. Um, city staff said, oh, by the way, we need six people to hire right away because, or we're, you know, we need more help with eight our people. bylaw, and, uh, eight yeah. people with our bylaw enforcement. Uh, there's this business savvy, right? It was eight people lower, 600,000. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But a $600,000 bill, I think, for that. And they wanted to bring it to you. And I think you, out of all the councillors whose clips I read, um, were the most aghast at the lack of strategic planning around that decision that council had just come through budget deliberations and here you're being asked to throw another $600,000 in the pot for these hires. Is Hamilton Council strategic enough, Lloyd? Uh, the relationship between staff and council, are we doing better than we were a few years ago? I think it has got better and, and I remember reading an email from you about a month ago. I think you said, let me get this straight. Since this new council's come in, you solved the stadium issue. Right. You've solved one of the probably the most politically contentious issues, which is area rating, which has the potential to run taxes up 16% in Glenbrook, 6% yes. to Maria in Ancaster. Yeah. Uh, and so we got that behind, brought in a budget of 0.8%. Mm -hmm. And you can push back at the police. If I got this right, I, yeah. that was your question. My to blog, us. Yeah, yeah, my blog said. I, I read know. that. I thought, well, at least somebody's watching it. And uh, but it, you know, I well, think I've done my fair share of criticizing. I mean, I get to go on TV every week for the last 15 years and criticize Hamilton Council. Yeah. Um, so when I do see progress, I wanted to note it. And that was, I, I forget what else was going. Oh, it was the federal election. And I said, you know, with all this blogging and all this chat about the federal politics which we'll talk to our guest Marie Butriani about in a few minutes, mm -hmm. um, with all this talk about the federal race, are we missing the good work that's being done by council? Because there had been no scandals, because there was no mm. rancor, uh, because everybody seemed to be just getting the business of the city done, I was afraid that that would go unnoticed by the cynics in Hamilton. Well, you give me a segue into something that you and the media haven't picked up well enough on from my perspective. Sure. Um, you know, coming from a very, you know, I, I reported to the Swiss, and. They say in the perfect world there's uh, German engineers, uh, British police, French Swiss lovers, Swiss and Swiss administrators. Yeah, administrators? They, they, okay. they are brutal. Give me that list again. There's um, German engineers, okay. British police, okay. French lovers, <laughs> and, and, and Swiss administrators. Now, I know the Italians can get offended at that. They yeah, think they're, they're the best they're lovers, the Greeks, you know. They're but they're <laughs> the Greeks are the best lovers. Yeah. <laughs> the Greeks are the best See, like, open up the she debate. She just relaxed from her whole life. everyone happy. But they say measure and key KPIs or key performance indicators yeah. that are no, pardon the freshman, BS. Right. And the KPI I love the most is value of building permits issued. Mm -hmm. That's the test. And how you benchmark off your, your areas around you. Mm -hmm. And because that's an owner coming in with a low bid number. So it's not a fictitious number. It's a contractor bidding a number, paying his development charges, which are not insignificant, paying for a building permit, 
and getting in the ground to create jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2010, that broke almost $1.1 billion, wow. over the billion. Yeah. The year before that, we were 480 million. The best ever before was 800 million. Wow. That's exponential. A billion dollars is more than Mississauga issued, wow. it's more wow. than Brampton issued, and it's more than Burlington issued. Hmm. And we're not getting attention to that. We're past the cusp, things are starting to go. And you know, I hope we see that, and I warned our finance staff, I'm, I'm looking for that next year to cascade down to increased assessment, which is reduced tax load, because that's the end game. You know, why do 35,000 people get on the Queenie every day to drive to Toronto to get work? Yes. I mean, and, and employers like Canada Bread are saying, you're right. So they're closing four plants in Toronto and building a 350,000 square foot facility up with the Red Hill uh, Business Park. Well, I think even in our chat prior to uh, going on air here, I was telling you that most of my client growth has been out of the city. You know, I'm one of those people who loves Hamilton but finds work elsewhere. And I think that it's so important to bring whatever the industries mm -hmm. are, to bring them to the community. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Listening to your passion, though, I was reminded, the first time I ever had a conversation with you was at a restaurant in Oakville, I think Seasons, down on the Lakeshore, a beautiful restaurant. And you were talking about key performance indicators. <laughs> you were passionate about KPIs. So I remember the time I was the executive director of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, did not have the business chops, certainly, that someone like you has. And I thought, wow, this is a really interesting business lunch. Do you, do you bring those values, those values of, you know, the old adage, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. You've got to have key performance indicators. You have to know what your benchmarks are. Do you bring that to council? Did it already exist, or have you really found well, I hope so. I, I remember it first struck me when I first year I was on council. Every meeting I went to, you know, they want one more staff person here. They want three more here. They want five more here. And it, it just struck me, boy, when I wanted to hire someone, not replace a position, create a new position. These are new positions. Yeah. I had to get like 12 signatures. <laughs> I could go issue. I remember industry. once I put a purchase order out with their $35 million, never told a soul. But you want to hire a person, you got just, and if you want to buy a pickup truck, you know, those are the two things they control over salaries and capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. And what the heck? We've got all these new FTEs coming on board. So I asked for a report on that. I don't know if you remember this. It was. Uh, I mean, Early on, I, think. I went. Oh, yeah, it was the first year. I went yeah. for uh, after I retired. I, I took a month. Probably shouldn't say this. Took a month and went to Africa, hmm. and and just toured all around Africa. Why shouldn't you say that? And you get a lot. Of, well, I shouldn't take a month off, but after they start a new job. <laughs> you got away with it clearly. So <laughs> but uh, I, I, I thought I would go out and uh, you know it'd give you a lot of time sitting in airplanes. It's a 12-hour flight from London to Johannesburg, and it gets you thinking and you jot down notes. And you're not being interrupted, and and so I asked for report and and. I know uh, Andrew Dresch will give it some attention. And this is a Swiss thing too. They said, you got something to tell me, you got to do it on maximum one page and maximum six bullets. Love it. Then I'll ask questions. Right. So just give me the hard facts. Mm -hmm. Don't bury me with 100 pages, I got to find them. Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I asked for a report. It's like life by executive summary. Yeah, just yeah. To, since amalgamation, how much has our population gone up and how much has our FTEs gone up? And I said, I want it on one page. <laughs> and, and, and it came back and was interesting. Uh, and, and also I want the cost per capita compared to other municipalities. Measured in a cost per capita, what's fire cost? What's police cost? What's social services cost? And, and th all through the major departments. And it came back that our population had grown since amalgamation, had grown by 3%, but our staff had gone up by 7%. Mm. Discounting staff that were brought in because we changed scope. For example, we took the water and wastewater back from Philip, and right. hired staff to it ourselves. We put sure. we parked so them than because that factor, that's yeah. different. And there was two or three other examples yeah. like that. Park those. We were up seven percent. Okay, I thought amalgamation was all about <laughs> efficiencies. Lighting. Yes, this isn't efficient, and and it got traction because it's a rare, rare, rare day that someone comes in now from staff and asks for a new position. They'll move them around. And but so the, when they did the other little while The other day, ago, it jumped yeah. off the page. Yeah, and you, they come you, in and say, well, <laughs> well, give me a break. Out of the budget process, you show up. You didn't warn us this thing was coming. And what's the message? You give them eight new FTEs. Now, I know the stats show that maybe we need it. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but 
you know, you the message is, well, yeah. if, if you want more staff, come in outside the budget process, then we'll, you'll get it. Do you think that, and that's, I would argue that's a strategic thing, right? If you're strategic, you're looking ahead, you're backing up your choices, you're, you're not making things as one ofs or, you know, you're not just always in the tactical, you're, you're actually looking bigger picture. It seems to me, and that was the nature of my blog, that Hamilton had, council had dealt with some of these long term uh, contentious issues. You seem to be getting more strategic. Um, no doubt because of your influence and bringing some of those skills to the table, but also the colleagues. I mean, it takes all of you to get on a new page. Do you feel as though Hamilton Council now is doing seri the serious business of running the city, less of the soapbox antics, less of the in, you know, entrenched in debates um, that you guys are, because my experience, I've worked in a lot of different cities, and our, no city's perfect. There are examples like Toronto that have some problems getting things done as well. But I've worked in a lot of communities where the council work together more strategically, more cohesively, more business oriented, mm -hmm. less of the small p politics. Look at Lauren, there's no question. And I think what drove it was, or drove it, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. my grammar mixed up. <laughs> that's why you give us the wine. Uh, that's right, <laughs> the wine is just to make people screw up their grammar. <laughs> I think what drove it is that uh, when we were at the doors, mm -hmm. It wasn't I mean, in Ancaster, I hear it every day, but it was across the whole city. The tax vote is too high. Yeah. And everybody got that message. Yeah. And so that's been a key focus now during this term. And do you think also post-Pan Am debate, um, nobody has the appetite for that kind of public sl you know, yeah, sludge match? I mean, that was, per that was, that was ugly. And it was, it was uh, you know, as I reflect on that, what did we learn from it? And, mm -hmm. Boy, maybe we don't need an NHL team to go through all this stuff again because uh, the media just just beats you up. It's all your fault. And doesn't well, we had Marvin Ryder in here and uh, in the lair, and he said that he didn't think Hamilton was viable for an NHL team, and he was part of one of the original bids back in the day that had real success. The Pan Am situation, I think, um, was uh, crystallized the, the challenges our community has with decision making. Well, <laughs> well, I think the learnings from the, the stadium debate were. February the 11th, 2010, so I can quote the day exactly because that stands out. We asked, we advertised a public meeting on where do you want the stadium? And, and we invited any delegation they wanted to come in. We started at 9.30, didn't adjourn to quarter to six, heard from over 30 delegations and mm -hmm. all but two said the same thing, West Harbor. Mm -hmm. Tiger Cats were there that day. Mm -hmm. So we okay, West Harbor. Get Mr. Real Estate Department, go start buying the land. And then the Scud missile got dropped in May Right. And we, we and we wore it, and uh, so if nothing else, you got to paper this stuff. It wasn't enough paper mm -hmm. uh, with the key tenant on that thing, because you know, everybody had a different story come August. They and, still and do. You know, we still have had lair casts where we've had Matt Jelly in here, P.J. Mercanti, Marvin Ryder. I think uh, everyone has their own take, their on, own what take on it. Um, Richard, I can't recall if during Richard Corso during his interview. Yeah, we talked about it even yeah. during Richard's interview. Everybody is still smarting from the oh, intensity yeah. of the of the. You know, Scott activity. Thompson with his elect do not reelect campaign yes. didn't matter what you accomplished or Just get what the what the credentials were or the, the, or the people that were running and and you know that wasn't a good experience that that was very stressful. Mm -hmm. And yet you um, ran again. You're here. You're on another term. It doesn't sound as though you're anything less than ambitious and optimistic for the city. Is that a fair characterization? It, it is. And I'll give you another interesting statistic. You know, I, I used to think that. Near the election, especially, I thought, wow, maybe I am doing the wrong thing. Until, I don't remember the Friday, when the, I think it was a Friday, that the Tiger Cats announced they're going to Burlington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got, I, I watched them scroll in on a Saturday morning. I was sitting in my den watching the computer, and they were scrolling in the emails. Yeah. But a thousand of them saying, shame on you. How dare you let a, an entity like the Tiger oh, Cats man. get away? You should all be thrown out. You know, you're all incompetent. Oh, jeez, a thousand emails. Two weeks later, Announced we put the deal together <laughs> to bring it back to Iverwin Stadium. And over the next four days, I got 1,500 emails. Shame on you for caving into corporate entities. And, uh, and the lesson in politics is you only hear from people who disagree with you. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's for the great. most part, there's a, a lot of people that are very thankful for what you do, and I hear from them a lot. But the ultimate test is election day. Yeah. And, and when you get 75% of the vote, um, Maybe it is going okay. Maybe I am doing okay. Oh, I think, and, and, and I that's, think that's, that's a little test. That's the understatement of the conversation that you're doing okay <laughs> as an elected official. Lloyd, I could talk numbers with you all day because you actually understand them and you're applying that business acumen plus, of course, 
um, who you are, which is a great guy, and you care a lot about our community, and you're making a difference on council. I'd love to talk to you more. We'll have you back in the lair. Have you back. Well, I love talking months. to you too. And well, thanks thank there. You. It's nice to meet you too. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Marie. <laughs> thanks. And I got Lloyd. the chair all warmed up. Yeah, you did for Marie. It's perfect. <laughs> Chats in the Lair is a Power Group production. Visit us at powergroup.ca or laircast.com or check us out on Facebook and follow us on Twitter.